Welcome back to The Chosen Life. I'm your host, The Chosen Lawyer. I have a very, very special guest for us today. I'm really excited about this episode. We got to chat off air, get to know each other beforehand and back again. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, <clears throat> I would say if there was a running for the most interesting man in the world, this guy would be a contender. The one and only Paul Hosh. Paul, welcome to The Chosen Life. Thank you so much. And uh, I, I, I think we're not going to talk about my pro wrestling career tonight, right? Well, is it a future pro wrestling career? Yeah, future, future. We're planning future for one. it. Well, that's all based on how the book goes, obviously. Oh, okay. So, yeah, yeah. Okay, so let's talk about the book. Well, we're going to get into there for sure. Yeah. Um, Mr. Paul Hosh, the author of the latest book that's just been released, Undercover in India. Uh, we're going to be talking about a very exciting book. Uh, you, you have a way with words, my friend. And where Thank you've you. gone with this story, there we go. Look at that, folks. Cover. See the cover. And okay. if you could bring it, well, when we talk about the book, we'll bring yeah. it up afterwards because I want to find out how that cover, how it all came about. Because it's very interesting, you know, as far as the book, the cover kind of says it all. So I'm going to want to hear your side of it. But first and foremost, author, artiste, lo <laughs> lover of life. Paul, what's the story, my friend? How did you get here to this point? Well, let's see. I, I think I, I cover this in the introduction of the book, I went to India as a 23-year-old ex-hippie. And when I was about to leave India, I had a guru. I studied with a guru in India. And when I was about to leave India, I asked the guru what I should do when I got back to the States, you know, looking for guidance. And he said, he thought about it for a second, and he said, I think you should write a book. And, uh, you know, I mean, I had never written anything longer than a college paper before. So it was like, it just went in one ear and out the other. Then I forgot about it, went back to the States, went to art school, went back to India again. Many things happened. And uh, in 2012, I was eating lunch with a friend who knew about this. And she said, well, what about the book? You know, are you ever going to write it? And I said, the book, you know, and suddenly it just came to me that, yeah, I should do this because I promised the guru, I told the guru I would do it uh, like 50 years ago. So, you know, it's probably about time to uh, get started. So now I got to ask you, we're winding yeah. back a little bit. Where were you in the States before you made that first trek to India? And what possessed you originally as an ex hippie to just go off to India? Was it the Beatles went there? So I got to go there. What was the mindset? Uh, that was kind of what I think I started out in high school. They told us about the Buddha, like when, when, you know, in the, in the 30 minutes that they covered all of Asian history, uh, they mentioned that the Buddha got enlightenment. And I thought, I don't know why it just, I thought that would be something for me because that covers all your bases. I mean, once you get that, you've won the game, you know? So I, of course, put it aside through the hippie and drug era. And, but I, even with drugs, I thought it was supposed to give you enlightenment. Like when I, I took LSD and I took, I smoked marijuana and I, I originally thought uh, it was going to result in enlightenment and in, mostly it just resulted in, uh, you know, commerce eventually. So at one point I got so sick of drugs and the whole culture of that. And I knew people that were buying guns and I knew people that were doing all kinds of things. So I said, I'm getting out. So I started taking, I wanted to take a yoga class and that's sort of how I started. And I just got obsessed. I read, um, have you ever read Autobiography of a Yogi? I did. Yeah, so that was the book that really, you know, sucked me in to that whole idea of enlightenment and finding a guru. And, uh, you know, I found a, an Indian yogi. Uh, of course, you know, these are very long stories. I'm really condensing them. And I traveled around the United States with him. Uh, and afterwards, and I thought he was a guru. And afterwards, when we came back to California, he said, why don't you go to India and, and meet my guru? And I didn't want to go because I was happy being this guy's assistant. This was as good as I thought it was going to get, you know. 
but he kept pushing me and pushing me and eventually I did go, you know? And, so, and very likely without being the guru, without going to India originally, there's no book. I take it. It would never have come to, you would never have fathomed it likely. I, I don't think so, but it's hard to say what would have filled the space of all the things that did happen. You know, I mean, something else might've happened, who knows, but, um, you know, that's what happened. So I, I don't know. I don't think so. Would you consider yourself first and foremost, an author, an artiste, both? Where are you on the spectrum? Uh, I don't spend a lot of time uh, thinking about what I am in relation to the world. Um, I wrote this book. And when I got started, I wrote two more books, you know, and I just kind of the same kind of uh, intensity that I put into everything I do. So now I've got three full books edited and ready to be published. The one has been published. Uh, what was the question? Well, there were multiple questions that you're trying, but this <laughs> one is about, are you an author, an artiste, or both? But Oh, yeah, yeah. But let, but let me, uh, let's rewind back for a second here. So the original book started getting written, and in between there, two other books got written, and then you came back to the original book. Did I get that right? No, actually, originally, the the other book was about all of my life up until the time I started studying yoga, like through the drug era in San Francisco, living in Haight-Ashbury, seeing all the rock groups, going to Woodstock, going to Altamont, you know, doing all the rock and roll stuff, uh, growing up in Jersey, New Jersey, and being like a kind of, uh, I don't know, like a rebellious kid. So I, I wrote about all that. And then I wrote about India, and it was too long. Like it was one book, but it was too long. It was like 600 pages. So I was going to read 600 pages about an unknown guy, you know? So, uh, and it was obvious, there was an obvious uh, separation between the whole drug era and growing up, you know, in a dysfunctional sort of semi-dysfunctional family and then starting out, you know, doing yoga. So I just chopped it there. And I made two books out of it. And then eventually I wrote a third one about Hawaii. Love it. Living, okay. I lived in Hawaii, right? Yes, so. which which we'll get to in a moment. Okay. Uh, there's a, again, I, I warned I warned <laughs> I warned all the listeners, this is an interesting fellow. So we're gonna be covering a lot of spectrum. So those of you watching, make sure you're hitting that subscribe button and the messaging. We want to hear your comments because Paul's got a lot to tell us. So Paul, it's funny, you know, I, I'm watching you, I'm listening to you. I feel like I'm looking in the mirror because yoga meditation were my gateways as well. I'm not sitting here today. I'm not living my life unless yoga comes into my life, meditation comes into my life. So your relationship early on in your life, in your 20s to yoga and meditation to where you are today, can, can you kind of walk us through as far as what, how does that function? Like how did yoga meditation become part of your life routine and what did they mean to you? Well, I think the, the real big uh, transition or the big moment was when I learned meditation from this Indian yogi living in America. Like I, I didn't want to learn meditation until I had a dream because in the autobiography of a yogi, uh, the, the kid has a dream and the guru comes into, comes into his dream and tells him where to go to find his teacher. So I said, that's what I want. So everybody was learning meditation from this Indian yogi and I was putting it off. I wouldn't go. And, and I said, I have to have a dream first. So every night I would go to sleep and try to have a dream, you know, to tell me to go see him and to have meditation from him. So finally he, he told me to come to, uh, he was living in, he was in Palo Alto, California. So he said, come to Palo Alto next Saturday and see me. So I went Saturday and I was kind of, unhappy because I was waiting for this dream and it wasn't coming. And I thought, you know, maybe I'm doing something wrong or maybe I don't have the right karma or something. So I went there and all these people, one after another, were going in the bedroom and learning meditation from him. And I was like the last one. So I said, well, I'm going to go talk to him, you know. So I went and sat down and there was really uh, heavy energy in the room, uh, you know, like kind of feeling woozy, you know. And um I told him my problem. I said, you know, I, I, I want to learn meditation, but I, I think I should have a dream first. 
And he, he, he looked at me and he said, meditate now, dream later. And then he closed his eyes and he taught me meditation and that was it. And then after that, I got so buzzed from that experience, which was so different from anything I'd experienced in drugs. I told him, and I hadn't planned to say this, I told him, uh, I am at your disposal. Whatever you tell me to do, if you need any help with anything, I, I'm available. Like, I'm not really, I'm just going to yoga classes every day, you know. And he said, well, he was going to tour the United States, uh, but he needed somebody to drive him in the different cities he was going to. Did I have a car? And I had a Volkswagen bus like everyone else in the 60s. So uh, he said, well, okay, you come with me to the, to the first place was Kansas City. And then from there, I'm going to go to the East Coast. So I did that. You know, I, I toured with him for a couple months. And uh, that's how I got started, you know. And now you've been meditating with Buddhists for approximately 20 years, is it? Uh, yeah, it was sort of a substitute because I wasn't um, around my old group anymore. The the group that the guru was head of, he passed away. And then um, it was like, I don't know, I just needed a change. So my friends were going to Buddhist meditation in Hawaii where I live. And they said, oh, come with us. And I started going, you know, and I just went. I, I was I never considered myself an actual Buddhist, but I just really liked the energy of meditating together with other people once a week or so. You know, there's some special energy, I think, when you meditate with other people. So it just, uh, it enhances your practice, you know. So that was basically uh, why I did. And I made friends with all the Buddhists and we had great potlucks there. And, you know, it was a good, good thing. Cool. Good scene. Good Buddhist time. Now, yeah. But there was never a consideration to actually become a Buddhist monk yourself. Oh, no, no. I, I, I never wanted to be a monk of any kind. Um, although I did go in a monastery in India. I, I don't know. Did you ever, did you happen to read that part of the book? No, probably not. Yeah. I, 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 see, I saw some parts. I did not see that one. Okay. Well, I, I went into a monastery because I thought I was becoming degenerate. Like after art, I went to art school in Philadelphia and I thought, you know, I, I just thought, you know, I, there's all these beautiful women everywhere. And I'm like, I was just freaking out, you know. So I said, I'm going to go in this monastery and like clean myself out. But the problem was that if you go in this monastery, you have to commit your whole life to become a monk, even if you decide it was the wrong choice. That's how you, firm your commitment should be. But I didn't really think it out too carefully. I just went in the monastery thinking, oh, I'll figure out a way to get out of here later. How long so, did you last in the monastery? Uh, a couple months. A couple months. But I didn't, I didn't want to leave because I had, uh, I, I just felt like that was a bad look, you know. So I just kept waiting, and eventually, um, the Indian government. It, it was Indira Gandhi was the uh, president or prime minister, and she became sort of like a, declared martial law. And she declared uh, this group uh, illegal. So they came and arrested the people who were teaching us in this monastery, and they took them away. And then the next day they came back, the, all these police like wearing brown shorts, and knee socks and stuff with sticks. They came back and they took the next group of, of mon monks out who were teaching us. And now we were all alone there. And the policeman told me, Tomorrow, we're coming back for everybody. So figure out what you're going to do. So we decided we were going to get out. But the police were guarding the front. If we got out in the front of the monastery, we would walk right into them. So we decided we'd go out the back where the well was. And we s waited till like 4 in the morning. And we snuck out on the through the rice paddies and went into the neighboring town. And uh, that's when I went on. That's kind of where the title of the book comes from, Undercover in India. I went underground and stayed in India. Everybody else left. All of the foreigners, they all went somewhere, Sweden, I, and I stayed in India. Did uh, it occur to you at that point or before you met me that you were actually evolving into a jubu? Uh, not really. No, I, I never, never thought of that till I heard of you. I never yeah. heard that expression. Although I know 
if you look at, I read once that 80% of all the leaders of spiritual groups in the U.S. anyway, uh, are Jews. <laughs> Yeah. I don't know. I don't so, know. If we, I don't know if we can or should be saying that, but I will tell you this much: uh, for myself, born and raised Jewish, as, as yourself, and uh, also finding my way uh, to Buddhism, I, I consider it for spirituality, not as a religion. But when I try to describe to people what I am, because I always say, "What are you? What What do you believe in?" Well, I'm a Jew, but I also am into Buddhism. I follow Buddhism. Anyways, I'm like I'm a Jubu, and then it just started rolling off the tongue that way, and that'll be in my book, you know, down the road. But right yeah. now we're, we're, we're talking about you, but just again, remember there's some jubu there. It's funny. Okay. Whether we need a I'll label. Buy, I'll buy a copy. Deal. When your Na book comes out. Na um, okay. So I, ha I actually had, oh, are you going to say something else? The, the other thing I was just going to mention is as we're looking around at uh, the artwork behind you as well. Yeah. Is, these are all your paintings, Paul? Uh, yes. Yes. I so never have anyone else's paintings because when I do, they always go, oh, I like that one. You know, the one is my friend's painting or something. So I, I hide anything but my own. I got to tell people, think about this, because one thing about being able to put pen to paper and write a book, it's another thing to be able to draw as well. You, my friend, are a true artiste. That's beautiful work around you there. Oh, thank uh, you. So I'm going to label you. And, and even if you can't draw, you're still an artiste, but you are really an all-encompassing artiste. When did you know in your life, from the time you were born, that you had artistic ability? When did you feel it within yourself as far as the drawing aspect? Not yet. Still waiting? <laughs> yeah. No, uh, okay, so like I had problems learning in a traditional environment growing up. Very, like I just couldn't get good grades and I couldn't, I, I wasn't good at learning uh, by memorization and in the different ways that uh, we were taught like when I was young. So I got very bad grades and I, and they always told me, you're very intelligent, but you always get bad grades. And then there was no such thing as like ADD in those days. It was just BAD, you know? So I was like really put upon, you know, by my parents, by my environment, by my teachers, everybody was down on me. Uh, but uh, eventually I, uh, went to college and studied writing. I studied journalism. And uh, I wrote some stuff that got me in a lot of trouble, although now it would be really innocent stuff, you know. Uh, but in those days, it was like, why do we have to wear ties in the cafeteria, that kind of stuff. You and, know uh, you. Uh, I know. I was uh, on the edge. And also, you know, I did advocate. I said that, you know, smoking pot isn't going to kill people. It's fine. You know, and it teaches young people to doubt a lot of things the authorities are telling them. Well, that was a mistake. But I shouldn't have done that. It was it was true, but I should have kept my mouth shut. And they put it in the alumni magazine. And the alumni got me. They, eventually, they got me out. It's a long story. It's in the other book. Um, but, uh, okay, so I never wanted to write after that. I was, like, afraid it would damage me. <laughs> so I, I – I, and, and I wanted to – what else do I want to do? So I, I got into art and I was very, very bad. You know, I, I really, I couldn't draw. I didn't know what I was doing, but I eventually I talked my way into art school uh, in Philadelphia. I got in a really good art school because the head of the department had been to India. He had had a Fulbright scholarship in India and he thought I would, I was a good guy, you know? So he let me in despite my lack of talent. But now it's been like, 50 more years, you know, where I've been painting every day. I mean, eventually you get some chops, you know, I mean, I consider myself, you know, pretty decent now. Have, so have you, uh, presented in a gallery and shows, uh, have you done it professionally for that or is it more for yourself? Well, I, I, um, of course the, then now we're going to get into the Hawaii book, but, uh, I had a shop in a place called the International Marketplace in Waikiki Beach for like almost 20 years, painting miniatures, like on jewelry. And I, I painted um, women's fingernails, like Hawaiian pictures. And it became very popular. Like there would be big lines at night, you know, of people. And it was like an attraction. So um, 
and then so okay so i made a, a pretty decent living doing that <laughs> you know people would fly me to europe to paint in fashion shows like Nobody was doing it then. Now it's fairly common, but in 1980, you know, it was unheard of. You know, I was doing something that people didn't know about. And then uh, when I got enough money, I quit doing that and became a, a fine artist and uh, never really made money again. But um, my stuff was in a gallery in Honolulu. And um, one of my paintings was, uh, the guy calls me up from the gallery and he says, uh, uh, we want to put uh, somebody from a movie came and they want to put one of your paintings in a movie. I said, which, what was it? What, what painting was it? And what movie? He said, well, it was a little grapefruit. You know, I painted a grapefruit on a Hawaiian cloth. Basically that was it with a white background and they want to use it in the movie. They want to rent it. I said, they want to rent a movie. They have like 25, $50 million budget. They want to rent my painting. He said, yeah, that's what they want. I said, okay, I'll sign the release. So he sent me a release and they didn't say what the name of the movie was. It was just a movie about something to do with Hawaii. And about four or five, I forgot about it. Like they brought the painting back after a while and you know, nothing ever happened. About four or five years later, I saw on TV uh, an ad for a movie called The Defendant with George Clooney. And it eventually won the Academy Award for best picture. So I said, maybe this is the movie. So I went and nobody told me anything, you know? So I went to the theater and I took my cell phone and I timed it to see if the painting would show up. So I'd have the, and 31 minutes into The Descendants, George Clooney is yelling at some people because they didn't tell him his ex-wife was fooling around with some surfer or something. His wife was in a coma. So, so my painting is right next to George Clooney in this whole scene, it was about a minute, uh, half a minute or so, you know? So, uh, I mean, that was it, you know, I got in that movie. And then when the Academy Award show came on, they showed that same clip. Like my mother, who was like almost a hundred, I was walking, I wasn't watching the show, but I walked past the, the living room where she was watching it. And all of a sudden I saw my painting on national TV, you know, next to George Clooney's head. I'll send you a copy of it sometime. <laughs> how how surreal does that like, feel? Like did, it was so imagine, surreal. Could you have imagined I, in the million years that would happen? No, I, I I didn't I I didn't know what to think. But it's been a good story over the years. See, I have a lot of good stories, you know, so, but not much else. <laughs> li listen, life is all about stories. A, ma a yeah. measure a measure of man is is the level of his stories. Now, okay. Now, some people go to visit these places. You end up living in them, and you've traveled yeah. quite a bit. So now, were you watching Magnum PI one time and said, man, this looks like for me? And then you, how did you find your way to Hawaii out of all places? No, I was there before Magnum PI. There was still, um, what's his name, the show with Jack Lord? Hawaii Five-0 was just rapping. Oh, yes, Hawaii And I got there, yeah, the original one with Jack Lord and the uh, uh, other guy. I used to see him around, you know. Uh, anyway, so uh, uh, yeah, Magnum, once uh, where I worked, they filmed the Magnum with Frank Sinatra was uh, Tom Selleck's mentor, and they were running across a bridge about 20 times, you know. So yeah, I was there, you know, I mean, uh, I went over there because somebody offered me a job. Like they wanted me to take over their yoga classes. And also, uh, the guy said I could have this job in a halfway house taking care of mental patients. It was his job, but he could give it to anyone he wants. Now I'm giving away my third book here. Yeah, but so uh, that's why teaching, that's why I went over teaching teaching yoga and running a mental halfway house is pretty similar line of work, right? I would say. Um, I wasn't running it. I was like kind of like, like the guy that made sure they didn't burn holes and things, and uh, made, they had little day jobs and they had to clean the kitchen and you know. So my job was to kind of supervise them and and they told me from the first day they said don't think you can cure these people don't try to do that because you can't you're just here to kind of keep order and make sure things don't you know go amok but how how, how do you feel once actually you're in hawaii <laughs> though that the place must have grown on you pretty quickly i mean i've never been i heard it's incredible out there but you're the one person I've met that actually stayed long enough to actually live there. Most people last a week, a two, a month, but 
but it's expensive lifestyle. It's a different kind of lifestyle, but you obviously took to it. 33 years I was there. Um, so yeah, once I got there, like I really had no place to go. Like I had this job offer, which was a generic job offer. They had written a letter to the yoga group saying, can somebody come over? And then somebody showed it to me. This is, this is perfect for you. They got really good pineapples and papayas. And I said, no, I'm, I'm not interested. But then when I got out to California, I couldn't find anybody I knew. So I decided to take this job and I was almost broke. So I decided to take this job. I had just enough money to fly there and I'd have $200 left over, a free place to stay for a month or two and this job, you know, so I said, well, I guess I'll just do it. You know, I had no interest in Hawaii particular, but once I got there, I started liking it pretty quickly. I, I liked the multiculturalism. I liked Asian people anyway. I've always liked Asian people. I don't know. That's like reverse prejudice or something, but me too. Uh, yeah, I just had this thing, you know, once I got there right away, I, I, I just wanted to get into the local scene and see what was going on. And, you know, and, and plus I was the head of this yoga group. There was like 10 or 15 people and I was like their leader, you know, so I had all this, you know, going on and uh, it was fun. Now, were you in Hawaii when you first started writing Undercover in India? No, I was here in Florida where I live now. You're already in Florida. Okay. Yeah. So it was 2012. I came here in 2009. There we go. Okay. So let's pull up the cover again. Let's take a look at it. Okay. So now we got some background on Paul Hosh. We understand where he came to and how he is today. And this is a very interesting cover. There's a lot going on here. <laughs> it's, yeah. So walk us through this cover, first of all, Paul, before you know, explain a little bit more about the book. How did this cover come to be? What was the brainchild for it? Oh, well, I guess uh, it was kind of a compromise between me and my publisher and her husband. So they like this. Can you see this little figure here? I love him. Uh, I have, uh, I, well, I, I feel like we, if we were in the same room, I, I, I was just fooling around with it in the kitchen. Um, it, it's just this one figure, you know, there was no background, no, no people. This is a photograph. So they wanted to use this guy and I wanted to use a photograph of the Ganges. Okay. This is the people bathing in the sacred river because I felt this guy was a little too jokey. You know, he it was, I, I could be wrong. Right. But, but I thought it was too humorous and I didn't want people to expect a funny book. Because then, you know, it's both. It has funny stuff in it, but it gets serious too. So I felt it, it, it was too frivolous. And they said, no, no, it's great. It's great. Because they're much younger than me. And they're, you know, go for it, you know, kind of people. But I said, no, I want to use the picture of the Ganji. So slowly we merged our two ideas, you know, and we wound up with this. And, and, and the publisher wanted big letters. And I said, well, why? We don't need big letters. No, she wanted big letters. So... That's sort of like what happened. It became an amalgam of our different uh, ideas. And this is a memoir written and illustrated. So, yes. so, you, so now, did you take the picture as well at the Ganji? No, no, no. It's a, a stock photo. Oh, it's a stock photo. Okay. So yeah. it wasn't that you were bathing in there with them and you're like, I got to take a shot of this and that brought a big memory. Uh, well, there, there, there are several chapters in the book about being around the Ganges. Yes, like, yes. I, I I, mean, I just like was awed by the place. Like, you know, it was like, like I say in the book, like I sort of felt like I lived there before, you know, you probably, like I'm not, prof you, you probably did in a different, lifestyle. you know, yeah, I don't know. I don't profess to know any of those things, but mm -hmm. it had a very familiar feeling and that just the energy there there were people singing, uh, like, uh, Kirtan is like a, this repetitious Indian singing, like, mm -hmm. and they were singing Sita Ram, Sita Ram, you know, like that for 60 years straight without a break in Six this zero? one spot. Fix, oh. Then they go to sleep and at some have, point, or did they have somebody to take over? No, different them? people. Gotcha. They gotcha. have different people coming in different tunes, but yes. the words are always the same. And they had speakers that blasted out all over the Ganges. And these people would play with tablas and harmonium and they'd sit up there <clears throat> and, uh, you know, 
Where are you going to get that kind of energy, right? You're not going to find in it. India. in India. Yeah, it's, it's, it's not in the Florida. I don't think it's in Toronto, but it's it's in, it's at the Ganges. And the Ganges and the Banaras, Banaras is a ten thousand year old city. So we're we're dealing with stuff that is far beyond anything that I can even imagine here. You know, so I was pretty uh, you know impressed, and and they burn bodies because people go there and they bring the you know they believe that if if you die by the ganges that's a blessing the ganges is a sacred river to them so they would bring the uh, old people and they would die and they would burn them there and then they uh, they would carry the body around the city and chant and stuff it was just a really trippy place so yeah i i that's why i wanted to put that picture there you so know that- to tie that in so I got to say, as somebody who wrote, started writing his first book and yeah. stopped it, went back and read it a year later, said, screw this, ripped it up, go away. <laughs> you sat on it. You had this time lag of about 10 years. Why this book and why today do you think that you're able to bring it over the finish line and you couldn't do it back in 2012? What changed for you, Paul? No, I I started in 2012. Right. But I couldn't do it in 1961. No, I just no, but, didn't no, have... No, but that, even, yeah. even if you started in 2012, you know... I never stopped. You just kept I've been writing going it. ever uh, since. Yeah. Uh, so you kept on writing until been, you were ready. Gotcha. 11 years I've been working on this three books, this project. Yes. So, okay, let me... Let me um, if you don't mind, I'll tell you um, how my process worked and works. So I used to listen to psychologists on the on the NPR on the radio, and there was a, um, a psychologist. They don't have him anymore. His name was David Viscott. I think he passed away. He did. But he, he my therapist uh, uh, plays his videos for me sometimes. Oh, okay. Powerful well, guy. I was. He did I was pass. A fan. He, uh, he's a great guy. He has passed away. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, so David. I was a. So that's no. That's good. We we have that in common. You know. We have a but, lot in common. You and I. Yeah, I think so. So, so I was I really was a big fan of his and it helped me psychologically because I was dealing with issues, you know. So, one day he started talking about his books and how he writes. And he said the way he writes is he just writes anecdotes. Anything that comes into his head, he he just writes it down and then he has a secretary type it up. And eventually, he puts it all together chronologically or you know, however it's supposed to work for the book. So I thought, when I heard that, I thought, I think I could do that. You know, that sounds like a very good way. I, I, you know, I don't think I could sit and say, okay, now I'm going to start in 1970 and go to 1976 and write down everything that happened. That I would have had a panic attack or something. You know, I would have been, I can't do this. But writing anecdotes, I could write anecdotes, you know. So I got a bunch of yellow pads, and I just started writing down anything I could think of from any part of my life, if it was interesting to me. Like the fact that I remembered it sort of implies that it might have been interesting. But I, I, I just started writing. And then I, re- I realized when I was out at the gym or, 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 or somewhere at the shopping, I, I would think of a great idea. And then by the time I get home, I forget it. So I started carrying around a Sony tape recorder. This is before cell phones were in full bloom 2012 you know we were still using uh, flip phones with no recorder so so i would use my recorder i'd come home and i would write it on the yellow pad so eventually i don't know the exact year but within a few years i had 1500 pages written like of anecdotes just the good stuff you know i i, I didn't write about you know what happened i had for breakfast or anything you know so then I I had a Mac and I I found they had enhanced dictation. In other words, you could read it. You could read all these. I read all the stories into the computer. Like just and each one was a separate document, you know. And then I found that what went where together and I started putting it together and pretty soon I had that 600 page book and then I divided it in half. So that was that was basically my process. I mean, I had intention to see how far I could get. But I didn't know when I started 
that I would be able to write a book. I I, I had written before, but I, I sort of had the same experience as you. I just would read read it over, and there was it was too self conscious, too too like um, trying to project something that might not have been real, you know, or something. I don't know what I was doing, but I, whenever I would read it, I would feel shame, you know. But when I started doing this, it 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 worked, you know. The stories worked, everything worked. And uh, I got an editor. Editing is very important, I think. I got a, a guy who played in the symphony in Honolulu, and he, he edited um, the whole book for me. And then I found another friend of mine from... I knew from a long time ago, he, he said he was an English PhD. If I ever needed anything edited, let him know. So I dumped about all 600 pages on him a little at a time. And beautiful man that he is, he edited the whole thing. I mean, he got annoyed with me a lot because, you know, our view of literature was <laughs> at variance, you know, like he was more like, you know, I don't know. He was like in the high high art and I'm in the more low art, like, you know, Truman Capote, uh, Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas. You know, I like that kind of stuff and uh, star auto, uh, movie star biographies, you know. So we were a little bit, you know, but eventually we worked it out, you know, and, and that's that. We're here today. The finished product is out. Now, <laughs> I know I know we have the same editor publisher. Uh, when you when you sat with them and you envisioned the audience for the book, who is the audience for your books, Paul? Who would you say is the is there a target audience, or who do you see the type of person as far as going online, ordering, and 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 reading, listening to the book? You know, I have this little personal trick that I do with my art. Like I think of somebody that I want to see this thing I'm painting, a particular person, and and somehow that inspires me like i think wow i'm really gonna do this good so that person will really like it and be impressed and i sort of did the same thing with my writing i would at various times i would well people from my old meditation group or you know my sister you know or certain friends uh in honolulu that encouraged me to write down because i used to tell them stories all the time i say oh they say you got to write this down and i think well now i'm writing for them so I would just think of different people that I actually knew and write for them, you know. But in the end, I don't remember what was what. It's just like, you know, it's, it's not only, relevant anymore. It's only when you're in the moment, I guess. Yeah, it's it's part of a process, you know, to get to get inspiration so you don't feel like, oh, why am I bothering to do this? You always have that one person or one group or one, you know, a uh, friend in mind or a relative that you want you want to impress or you want to you know give something to in a way you know so yeah if there's one thing i could say about artists as far as having spent enough time with them and associating with them and speaking with them is they tend to be a pretty sensitive bunch at the end of the day okay they see the world in one way and the world tends to see it in a different way sometimes and there's one thing I could say as far as for those artists out there, whether it's written, painted, sculptures, so that's, I, I, and I've met them before, Paul, the ones that don't want to share their art with the world because they're so afraid of what the reaction is going to be. And the, any one word of criticism will, will crush them. For those people that you know have gifts that they could share with the world but are so afraid of what the reactions are going to be, what would you say as a mentor to those people? Uh, I would say that just ignore it and just do what you do. Like I, I have that same kind of sensitivity in a way. Uh, my, especially my mother, she was very critical of everything I did. I mean, Jewish mother, right? But, uh, and they're not all that way, right? We don't, Mine we don't, too. Want, to, Mine we don't too. want to paint. We don't want to paint with, with a too broad a brush here because we're, you know, I'm sure that nowadays, like if I see the, what the, kind of mother a lot of my friends are they they were fine you know but uh my mother actually thought she was helping me by being critical it wasn't uh, it might have been a little jealousy but but there was also that you know so i grew up with a very uh enhanced feeling of shame and inferiority you know so i i like to hide everything you know if i had my choice and at the same time i had a need to be admired, you know? And so those those two things uh, 
somehow the need to be admired eventually won out, you know. And uh, I, I really found a lot of support among strangers that I never found in my own family, you know. And I, I don't think that's so uncommon. Uh, so, uh, yeah. What was the question again? <laughs> well, you answered it, and I could okay. you answered it, and I could tell you, folks. Uh, I grew up the same way as Paul. And uh, Paul, I mean, we all kind of have our aha moments. I yeah. remember when I was uh, 12 and I'm in grade seven and I come to my mom and I said, mom, no matter what I'm going to do, I'm never going to be able to please you. So I'm going to do it for myself from now on. Yeah. Whether you like it or not, not going to matter. I'm doing it for me. And then, I mean, I had that shame for a lot of my lifetime. And I read a quote once and that's what really stuck to me. It was, whether you get a bad reaction or you get a good reaction, the greatest thing of all is to get a reaction from your audience. The worst thing is no reaction at all. Right. And when I started blogging and I had the times where there was no views, no comments, didn't feel so great about it. The most popular one, our, our blogs that I had written were the ones that were the most hated. They were bashing me and then people were bashing those comments and it became this whole cycle. <laughs> but I'm like, wow, I got a hundred thousand views. This is amazing. And so <laughs> I kind of got past it and you know, you learn to make fun of yourself a little bit. And then, especially when you go on video, like one thing is when you're writing behind the scenes, but when we're doing what we're doing right now, and I read the comments on YouTube, that guy's so stupid. I hate his beard. I hate his forehead. He looks like uh, <laughs> this. He looks like a, that. I wish he would get off my screen. I never want to listen to his annoying voice ever again. Really? Like, wow. Amazing. But when I hear those comments, those are the most viewed episodes. The ones that are like, oh, he's so great. I love it, blah, blah, blah. And there's nothing else. Those are the least viewed. It's so funny how our society works. But yeah, I'm hearing what you're saying. And you know, for a lot of us, it does come back to, I think all our therapists would tell us, and those of you not in therapy, I'd say get into therapy immediately. It's good because you work out your body with a trainer. You should work out your mind with the therapist. That's how I put it. I've done it. And we should all still be doing it. And it's there. And a lot of what we're carrying, we're carrying from our childhood. And there's this point where we can let it go or we can keep let it, carrying the burden, I would say. And it's, it's the greatest feeling in the world when you can let go of that burden and understand, hey, it's not me. It's that person. You know, yeah. our mothers, our fathers, you know, we didn't grow up with them. We don't know what kind of childhood they had and what kind of childhood their parents had. It becomes a cycle. And at some point, we got to break that cycle. We got to be able to move free. And you found your roots, a very unique route, may I say, and made that inspire others to find their route, whether it's in India, Florida, Hawaii, in a monastery, painting, whatever it is. <laughs> Wherever. Find find your route at the end of the day. Uh, yeah. When, when people do speak to you, though, and have read the book and they provide the comments, I, again, what is that feeling as far as connecting with the audience when somebody's actually picked it up, read it, discussed with it. Uh, does it ever feel real? Is it uh, versus when you write it for yourself? I, I take it as a compliment. Like like somebody emailed me, a friend of a friend, woman I don't know really well, but I've you know had dinner with her and her friends sometimes. And she said, oh, I'm reading your book and it's riveting. The word riveting, yeah, I'm hanging on to that. You know, I, I'm putting that in my my treasure box. And uh, my sister uh, read it and she said, you know, she says, I've known you all my life, but I never knew you did all of that stuff. How do you remember all that? You know, I mean, all of that is like gold, you know. I mean, you don't know what's going to happen when you write something and you don't know who's going to read it. You just put it out there and then, uh, you know, Different people have uh, telling me they enjoy it. So that's my joy. And now I got to ask you, you know, you live in the moment, you plan for the future, whatever way you can. What is the future <laughs> of Paul Hoss? So you've, you've, you've lived it's, this it's, life. It, it could be short. <laughs> it, <laughs> listen, we don't know. We could go tomorrow. We could be here for another 50 years. But as far as from, from, from your art, from your life, what's the next chapter for you, Paul? You know, I mean... That is a terrific question that I have no absolute, you know, answer to. Um, like my intention when I came here, like I came here in 2009 in Florida, 
to take care of my mother who was 90. She was in the hospital. She looked like she was going to die. I said, okay, you know, I'll just stick around. My, I, had, I was in between houses. My stuff was in storage in Honolulu. I said, I'll just stay here. Maybe she'll last a couple months and then I'll clean up everything and go back. She lasted 13 more years. She lived to be 103. And I was stuck here. And every year I was thinking, oh, I can't wait to go back to Honolulu. But at some point, it started like being like this started being normal, more normal. And then, you know, my friends, some of them kind of moved on and things have changed. So I don't know what I want to do. And then, you know, I don't know. So I'm still I'm still in flux as far as that goes. I've, I've got a nice house to live in. Uh, you know, I'm doing my painting, my writing, uh, getting that book published was a major milestone for me. You know, I mean, that was huge for me, you know, and uh, so I don't really know, but I feel pretty good. So it's not a, it's not a, like a bad problem. You know what I mean? It's just a matter of, do I go back to Honolulu? Do, do I stay here and try to develop some kind of a social world here or what, you know, I don't know what I'm going to do. The guru would but, tell you, keep living and life will come. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I don't have much choice. <laughs> I got to ask you, what, yeah. what did you feed this woman to keep her to 103? What was the secret? I think she was, she needed somebody to torture, you know? So as long as I, when I came here, it was like, Okay, now I've got someone, you know, before I was just this lonely old lady. But now I've got this young, young man I can manipulate. I can get anything I want from him, you know. And so, you know, and I think for both of us, it was like, we never got along, you know, but we learned to get along because we had to get along. It was too inconvenient not to get along for both of us. She needed me very badly. And I needed things to not be unpleasant like, i just can't handle that so we learned you know to uh deal with each other it was never like oh mom you know it was just like okay what do we do to make this work you know when you get it was bored, a hell of an experience when you get bored one night and if you can't sleep there's a movie you may want to rent it's called throw mama from the train oh yeah i think i might have seen that you may want to go back DeVito. You may want to go back and watch that one yet okay. again. Um, Is that John Candy in, in too, right? Mm, I'm trying to remember no? right now. It's a, it's a, it's a bit, I'm trying to remember who played uh, the main character. It's escaping me now, but... Uh, I know I Danny I DeVito I, was... I don't think it was Richard Dreyfuss, but it was somebody... or No, it was... Um, uh, I can I can even picture his, his face right now, but uh, it was a slapstick uh, style uh, comedian, yeah. like you know, self deprecating. Anyways, yeah. Uh, but you know, the whole premise goes to live with his mom, and you know, she's on his head, and you know. Anyways, you got the kind of the idea. Yeah. Um, well, yeah. I mean, my mother was a good as a person. She was fine. She was very intelligent, very you know, quiet, and for the most part, it's just I'm I just like to dramatize it. I mean. There was definitely that critical part of her when she was younger. And I just, when, when I moved here, I just told her, look, if you're going to be like that, it's just not going to work. I said, we're not going to be able to get along. So she thought about that. And she kind of, she would just sit there when I asked her, oh, what do you think of it? She'd go, you know, she would try not to say anything, but then she would always come out with some kind of criticism anyway. But by the time she was old, it was too late. I was already, uh, kind of beyond that, you know. Her mom, your mom and my mom would have gotten along really, really well. I think. Probably, so, yeah. yeah. Yeah, they could have discussed us. Uh, absolutely, you know, I, I'll just sum up this <laughs> one. When I, when I told her I'm going to do a podcast. Her first reaction was, why would you do a podcast? Who would listen to <laughs> yeah. you? You're not that interesting. Are you sure yeah. you want to do that? And I'm like, thanks, mom. You know, but uh, this is Jewish mom guilt, as they call it. Now, right. Now, for those otherwise, you know, uh, to our world now, we've spread a lot of inspiration and positivity, moms aside today. And I love my mom. Oh, yeah, it was just Mother's Day, right? It was. And I wish it was our post-Mother's post Day. Post-Mother's Day. Yes. 
And, I and, wish your mom happy Mother's Day. And too. I'm dramatizing as well. My mom's 86, and I love my mom dearly, and uh, she's going strong. So may she go to 103. But in all okay. seriousness, now, we spread a lot of positivity today, Paul. And we're summing up today's episode. The message to the world, if you could put out as far as your thoughts and you could put one message out there to inspire the people, what would it be? I guess to fo follow their dream. Don't don't delay. If you if you want to write a book, sit down and get your yellow pad out and start writing. I'll, I'll give an example. I used to teach uh, drawing portraits in Honolulu after I finished working in Waikiki at the uh, art school, uh, art museum there. And my students didn't want to draw hands. They say, I, I can't draw hands. So they would leave them out. And I said, well, how are you ever going to learn how to draw hands if you never draw hands? You have to draw them bad before you can draw them good. You can't autumn. Maybe one, like out of a million million, can draw hands without practicing. So basically, whatever it is you want to do, do it bad until you can do it good. But do what, you, do, do what your heart tells you to do. I guess that would be my, my primary message, you know. The next time I'm really bad at something, I'm going to remember that to myself. Do it bad. Yeah, just until you can until do it Until you good. can do it good. Because if you don't do it bad, you might never be able to do it good. Love it. And at least you have a chance, right? <laughs> Love it. Let's see the cover of the book once more. Yes, sir. So, ladies and gentlemen, Paul Hosh with his book, Undercover in India. Uh, Paul, people want to obtain copies. Where do they find it? Amazon.com, Apple Books, Barnes and Noble. And um, I think in Canada, it's something Indigo. Indigo, so, something. something along those lines. Yeah. And uh, also, I found out there's a library app called Hoopla. So, a lot of libraries you can get free uh, ebooks. It's an ebook, by the way, not a physical book. It's only ebook format, yes. Only, yeah. And and they they can get it for free from the library also. Get to Amazon people, the right spend the money, yeah, let's support Amazon. Let's, yeah. Get to Amazon. Don't worry about the free books. Get to Amazon. Actually, I get more from the free books. Oh, get to the, the free library. books. Forget Amazon. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. I didn't know that. Our publisher told me that. You you learn along the way. That's right. Wish you the best of luck with Undercover India. Thank you very much. Everybody make sure to purchase your copy. We'll put a link in the bio. And we'll see you real back soon on The Chosen Life. Great. Namaste, my friend. Namaste to you. I enjoyed it very much. As did I. It was a pleasure having you.